Welcome to How to Rock the Stage Show, a show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back once again for Rock the Sage Show. Rich Bontrager back here Wednesday night. It's 7 p.m. Eastern time, and it's great to be back once again to talk about how to rock the stage, shine on camera, shine on stage, talk with us experts that help other people do this as well. We always bring some of the best, most amazing guests. And tonight, let me ask you a question. Have you ever wanted to be involved with movies and special effects? I can tell you, when, when, when I was a child, I loved special effects. I still love special effects. And the first movie yeah, I think of right away was Star Wars or Planet of the Apes. Those films are so creative, full of special effects. Tonight, we have a special effects genius with us. Been found in film and TV, so you're going to want to stick around and learn more about that. But first, let's thank our sponsor once again, Autovita Studios, is a proud sponsor of Rock the Stage Show. Autovita has the experienced team paired with their state-of-the-art remote recording processes, and it brings your message to the market even faster. They're going to work with you to produce your audiobooks, your podcast series, and they're going to help you distribute it through the marketplace for more information. To learn more about Autovita and their amazing process, go to autovita.com. Well, tonight we're going to get into the misadventures or the adventures, whichever way you prefer to think about that, the adventures and special effects with Chris Sturgis. Now, Chris has been involved with film industry for over 25 years. He started playing with explosives and fire in the movie industry in Vancouver, where many film TV shows are always shot. He began with Stargate SG-1, and he was involved with season one, the very beginning of that show. His credits include Chronicles of Riddick, Alien vs. Predator, The Requiem, Final Destiny 3, Arrow, Masters of Horror, X-Men, The Last Stand, and Supernatural, and much, much more. Chris says, finished just recently, season six run of the hit TV series, Riverdale, and he's the assistant special effects coordinator. Without any further ado, let's blow up the stage and bring in Chris. Good evening, Chris. Great to see you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so for... Over 25 years, you have played around, blown things up, and played with special effects. So what first got you into that? Because, again, as, as a kid, like I mentioned, I love that stuff. But what got you into it? Amusingly, I uh, got started in pyrotechnics, and I got a chance to do the Symphony of Fire. And uh, now it used to be called Benson and Hedges. Now it's Festival of Light. But uh, we got to blow off a quarter million dollars in fireworks in 20 minutes. And uh, we did that several for a couple of years. And I, I just loved it so much. And then I thought, hey, I can do this more regularly because there's not a lot of fireworks work, you know. So doing it in film is more better, more fun, and way more blowy uppy. Well, and being in Vancouver, it's really becomes the second Hollywood. Vancouver's taking over and so much stuff. So it's it's your backyard. It is now. When I started, we were struggling. We were the we were the bad boys. We were when Hollywood went and the, the bad guys in Hollywood went and shot elsewhere. There was actually protests and and challenges around that. Really? Now, now that I now, never heard. Now we're the biggest. Now we're we're big. We're actually one of the largest production centers in the world. So okay, MacGyver was shot in yeah. Yeah. Vancouver. Was it? Yeah. Before that, all, all this went down, was that during that time, that kind of clash of Hollywood and Vancouver started? That was before the time. We, As long as we were little players, they didn't mind us at all. When we started getting uppity and started shooting things like, you know, when we were bringing Schwarzenegger up here, yeah, they started to get upset. And when I, uh, when I shot um, the... Um, uh, American Bandstand. Yeah. We were referred to directly as Frostbacks. No way. Really? Very I've derogatory term. That. We won an award for the for what we did on screen for American Bandstand, and they ignored us and removed us from the credits. Wow. Now, now I know, like last week, we had a stuntman 
often he's unlisted, you know, but they're not going to reveal that Harrison Ford was doubled by Alan. But mm -hmm. Alan Robinson is in some credits and some films don't. Tell me a little bit about that. Because I, I, why do they do it sometimes and why do they exclude you like that? Sometimes it's political. For example, in this the case of American Bandstand, uh, most of the time it actually just comes down to screen real estate and who's getting credits, who's who's paid for the privilege of being on screen. Uh, a lot modern times, they're actually starting to put a lot more of us on the crew in the, the credits because the credits are ginormous anyway. Well, and again, even in the opening, I referenced Star Wars. Now, I, I can remember watching the credits. It was special effects pages and pages and pages of special effects. It was a different people. time. It took that many people to do the, the effects because yeah. it was all practical. Now you look at it and this visual, or the special effects will be a department of maybe maybe 15 or 20. And then the visual effects will be pages and pages and pages. So you've been special effects technician a lot. You've done other things as well. But for, for those who are maybe not quite deep into this, what's a special effects technician? Special effects technician is the utility guy that makes weather happen on screen. 60% of our work is smoke, wind, et cetera. Um, you want it, another 30% of our work is um, leaves moving, uh, but also snow, when you have snow or rain. So 90% of our work is just making weather happen. 10% of it is the fun stuff, is the massive gimbals, the big explosions, the things on fire, that's 10% of our job. The rest of the time, we're just making wind and smoke. So when we see people inside a cabin on Supernatural, let's say they're inside the mm -hmm. cabin, you're actually in a studio, but there's rain coming out the back rain gutter, just in the back window, just dribbling. That's you guys. Yep, absolutely. There's somebody maybe with a, a hose um, or, or whatever, and we've got some rainproofing in because it's in a studio. You can't let that water hit the studio floor because it'll go under the set and then the set will rot. So you capture all the water and you just, and maybe you've got a recycling pump. If you do it a lot, you just have a little, a little pump and it just goes, <laughs> right? Um, sometimes we get the big, the big rain out and that's when it gets fun. <laughs> now, Again, going back to our comparison here, back in the day of fireworks to on a set, either hosing or rain guttering, what's your mind go through that process of the years of you going through this and seeing what was to what is now the, to where it's going? What What's your mind telling you? Well, it it did travel all over the place when when I when they first introduced um, HDTV. A lot of guys said, oh, my God, it's going to ruin our industry. It's going to change everything. And American Bandstand was actually, it was called American Dreams, was the first HD TV TV show shot in North America. Uh, wow. So we're the first ones using HD camera. And what I found was in doing that was I was putting more smoke in because I was actually creating that nostalgic look. Because the, the blurry background that you get from a real camera when it's out of focus, I yeah. had to do that with smoke. Very, very light amounts of smoke that you could not see, for example, between the camera and the nose, right? But you'd see it in the background as blurriness. So HD actually produced a lot more work for us. Well, and when, when, when you get into those optical effects that are in real time like that, how much prep time do you have to experiment and find out? Because when they say accident, you go, that's eh, too much. We can't see their face. We can't see their hands. You got no time. You, you got no time. You got no time. You got to be right, right now. You have no experiment time. On the other hand, when, for example, I've done 200,000 hours uh, or some obnoxious amount of time, and 60% of that was doing smoke, I got a bit of experience doing smoke. <laughs> Also, the director DOP, you've got a, a special effects supervisor, um, like a, a set lead who's behind camera, and he's talking in your ear and saying, too much smoke, too much foreground smoke, cut it by half, and you adjust on the fly. Uh, the director never sees that most of the time, and that's good, because should you ever actually have to reshoot something because of what too much smoke, 
Right. You're in trouble. You're going to get smacked. Well, and maybe people don't even understand that. The fact that you guys are all wired for sound. Oh, because it is like an orchestrated concert, but you're all listening to a crane shot, a movement shot, go here. You guys like the fuse here. So we're going to walk in the door. You're going to have a gush of water come flying through. It's all timing, but you guys are all wired in, aren't you? Absolutely. And remember that every shot is not done as a continuous shot like that. Each effect is its own shot, yeah. right? It can be a 10 second cut. It could be a minute and a half cut, um, but there'll be cues in there for special effects to do the things they need to do. So before we go any deeper here, you're a movie junkie. I'm a movie junkie. You're involved in the industry. What's your favorite movie that you've been involved with? I think... Chronicles of Riddick is still my favorite movie. I was on it for eight months. I did uh, four months building it. And then I got to flip around and actually be on set and operating the, the actual different special effects and things. And the scale of that was unimaginable. We had sets that were five acres in size and we used the entire set. It was amazing. How much of that was shot external because i know you know the ship and other things like that you know but and you also the man you, you had the big city in that one too we so how much of that is that studio city. versus really out we built the whole city we built the planet with the lava fields or the the uh the, we built that ship that ship actually was we created it we built the hangar for it this was one of the last movies it was 450 million dollar build or something insane yeah. Uh, this was one of the last movies that was almost entirely practical effects. Wow. It was the last big budget movie to be shot in Vancouver. So do you miss those days of the practical versus all the green screen, CGI, all the other stuff? Do you miss it or do you prefer the way we've gone now? I think we've gone too far as a pendulum swings already. We've definitely gotten too far into the CG side of it that you can see it in the act the actor's movements. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't buy it. When the first when the Rocket Man or whatever, the the um when that one came yeah. out, that was the first one shot entirely with a virtual background, and the actors complained that they couldn't act in that environment. So now we're starting to swing back. We're still we've swung a little bit too far into the back into the VFX. Like if you look at the Marvel movies, yeah. some of that doesn't play. Right. I right. want to come back a little ways and do a mix of both. The benefit of CG and, and the VFX, especially the layering and, and things like that, is you can have an actor in the middle of an explosion that would be exceptionally dangerous for them. Yeah, so... It's safety. Well, but even with that, and I was even going to mention Supernatural, for example, you know, they're carrying torches sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I know the flame's not real because it doesn't quite look right. And sometimes it is real. It should be real. That's a perfect example of there's no reason for those torches to be CG. I did Dark Angel with uh, James Cameron. Yeah. And we built torches because we had 30 background with torches. And they were all propane torches. And they were handheld. And they had a little hip pocket with a propane tank on it. And they fully controlled it. And they were in cost. They were in like big ma major costume. And they just controlled everything because we trusted them to do that they no longer are allowed to maintain and control their own flame effects as per the DGC, etc. So now so, we've got another layer of complexity and safety. Right. But again, there's some shots you need the real flame. There, there's some about the reflected do. light coming out their face. There's something you about do. the heat. There's something about, you do want that danger field. You don't want them to realize this is real and I can't burn my partner. <laughs> It is a better way to do it, by all means. And when we start to move away from it, because it's not safe, then we all lose. The, the picture becomes less than it could be. How much of a voice do you as special effects people have when you get to those choices like that? Do you guys have a chance to say, hey, by the way, Mr. Cameron, uh, we prefer to do it in camera versus out camera? Or is that like the no-go range here? So it depends on on the relationship you have. On Riverdale, we had a, a an active voice. Um, we very much say yes, we can do that, and it totally depended on what role we wanted to take in terms of taking ownership of it. Which we usually that's not a great place to be 
because that means you're then responsible for the look of the scene. And as special effects guys, that's not our job. Um, right. But we want to contribute. We want to contribute safely. Again, we started to slide too far on the side of safety when things weren't allowed because it was perceived by somebody with no experience to not be safe. Right. So, yeah. No, and, and again, because just like I was talking with Alan last week about the stunt side, there's time for the stunt coordinator maybe to speak to the director. And he's been both stunt coordinator and stunt man. But there's sometimes you can't go there. It's You know it's a no-fly zone. It totally depends on really on how the set is and on the how the production, how the showrunners have set up the the feeling, the culture of the set. Uh, Twilight Zone, there was accidents involved, and as as everybody I'm sure knows, there was three people killed. Yes, the showrunners had set up an atmosphere where you could not talk to the director. If anybody had commented on any of about a dozen different things, the director would have changed it. And I worked with that director later. The director would have changed it and that, that accident would not have happened. But the culture in place was in the way. Nobody wanted to bring it up. So everybody said, oh, yeah, it's somebody else's problem, not my department, not my thing. And they ignored a safety issue that ultimately resulted in people dying. So well, let's go to one of my favorite shows. You were involved with Stargate SG-1, the first season. I want to talk about the process of growth, change, morphing, because you have the pilot. It was based on a movie. Mm -hmm. But as you go through the first season, every show, the first season is experiment. They don't know what's going to stick, what's not going to stick. You guys filmed in the same sandpit all the time. They have a great setup there. But what about special effects? Because it was new. They have this big dialing thing, the walkthrough, and... I know they built a real physical one. And then later on, they went to a CG version of it. They built three physical ones because we used them all over the place. We needed multiples. Uh, it was a fantastic show to work on because it was all practical. We were really lucky that we had the movie and the pilot already in the bag so that we knew what our feel was. We really didn't have to, to feel our way through what the series looked like. We knew what it looked like, and we were lucky that we had actors that clicked right out of the gate. Uh, it was so much fun. It was such a joy to work with those actors. The showrunners also kept it quite light, so it was very, very enjoyable to work on. There's more than a couple of stories that I would love to relate, but I won't because, ugh, you know. But watching you have to put a different that, rating on the show at that point? <laughs> well, no, because the, the stories that are a lot of fun are the ones that happen back scene. Right, right. Um, Which is what I love. First or second episode, third episode, I can't remember we where it was on an ice planet where they beamed into a, yes. a gate that was in Antarctica. Yes. We brought the entire special effects stage down to minus four. We turned we had a a three or four hundred thousand cubic foot freezer. And that was real ice and real snow, and all of that was real. So when, for example, Amanda Tapping is is trying to climb the, the wall to yeah. get out of it, that's real blood on her fingers. That was real ice, and she was really trying, and she was crying, trying to get out. And we were going, oh, my God, stop, stop, stop. And she said, no, I'm going to get this. Let me do this. This is acting. And it wasn't acting because she was so into the character that, uh, yeah. Well, and again, I know the episode very well, and I've read backstage story, but you just brought up an interesting point. Special effects is not just all blow up and blow up and other things. You literally, special effects is involved with freezing a sound stage. Yes. That's part of special effects. Weather. Weather is us. If you look at, oh, I don't know, any disaster movie, Titanic, all of those things, those waves, that's us. How do you learn that? How do you learn how to pull that off, create the energy, create the vibe, and keep it safe? Because, again, this is where you have to engineer it out, lay it out, doodle it out. How do you do that to make sure when you say go, it's actually going to work and everyone's also going to be safe? We figure it out because we figure it out. Now, the thing about special effects, to get into the department, especially up here in Vancouver, all right. You need to be you need to have at least three different trades. You need two years experience in three different sub trades. That can be construction. It can be auto mechanics. 
Um, and it could be plumber or electrician or welder or, but you need three trades because your brain needs to work on all those levels. By the time you're at, at where I am, I'm a plumber, I'm an electrician, I'm an electronic specialist, I'm a fabricator, I'm a welder, I'm a, um, a hydraulic specialist. Uh, I, I mean, pick, keep uh, auto body, um, the auto body and, and doing that and mechanics. And like, you have to know how to do all the trades, the pumps, the flame, the pyrotechnics. That's how you know, you basically, you call around, you've got to do something stupid like that stunt. Yeah. You start asking people, hey, you've done something like this before? No. Okay. How about you? Have you? No. Hey, I know a guy who's done that. Uh, the movie Reign of Fire. Yeah. There's there's a scene when the adult dragon breathes and basically completely burns out an entire river valley. Yeah. I commented on that, and the guy beside me said, yeah, I did that. Said, Pardon me? I did that stunt. We That burn was real was practical and it was 20,000 liters of propane in one burn. So now, yeah, if, yeah, I please, need, if I need to do something like that, I know who to call. Well, as you're saying all this, there's actor school, there's directors, even, even though more and more are going through directors on sets, learning behind the scene, doing the apprentice way. But there's a lot of craft and trade schools. Is there a special effects school that I've never heard about? Nope. Besides ILM. <laughs> nope. Even ILM is not special effects. ILM is visual effects. That's right. That's right. And that is not the same as special effects. So we, do, how do you really learn this? How do you get in? You learn on the job. So like I said, you start with three trades and a few, and so a lot of safety training. That's how you, you walk in the door as a permittee. And then you learn on the job. You learn by doing. I learned... Um, I learned how to do windshields when they said, oh, can you pop those windshields out, please? I went, uh, they said, there's tools over there. And I walked over to a tool, it popped open. And I said, oh, this is, I, okay, I got this. And I went and did it. So prime example, supernatural. The guys are always in the car. They're in babe a lot. Those are not all driving down the road scenes. They're in studio scenes, but they but they, you pop the window off, pop the wheel. You you got to learn how to do that. And sometimes they may not have planned to do that shot that way, but they're going to go, you know what? I'm going to do a window out sh shot. Can we just pop yeah. it out right now? And you have to be ready to they go. They say exactly you? that. That's exactly it. Hey, we want to pop this out. You want to get effects? Hold on. Two minutes. Okay. Jump in. We're up. Usually if we say two minutes, we're done in 60 seconds. It's wow. Now, Supernatural won an award for the what's called poor man's process. The scenes where they're in the car, they yes. won an award specifically for that piece. And, and again, they did it so seamless from exterior, real world to studio back and forth. And for as much time they spent in that car, they spent more time probably in the car sometimes than anywhere else in the entire episode. <laughs> mm -hmm. They were very good. <laughs> So we're talking about what has been, what is, where do you think this is going? Because you talked about the pendulum. Mm -hmm. Where do you think this is really going? Is the pendulum going to come back to a middle ground? Are we going to a new frontier of special effects? That For the special effects specifically, it's a little bit tricky. There's definitely a rising fear. And the more the lawyers get involved, the less actual practical effects we're going to be allowed to do. I think there's a lot of people who believe in practical effects and believe in the true art of yep. filmmaking. And yeah. those we're going to still see fit special effects and, uh, and practical effects in those. Also, you'll be able to tell the difference. You'll see it. If you've got the budget for practical effects, you're going to do it and you're going to spend the money to get around the safety, safety uh, issues. Is there a, I'm not going to say war, but is there a war between special effects and no. what you do? with the CGI and non-CGI and then what you do with. We work very closely together because they need us and we need them. As you talk about, like, for example, the, 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 um, the driving with the, the car with the fellows on supernatural. Yeah. So we're moving the car. Special effects is actually rocking the car. We've got lights flying past. We've got, I'm sitting there with a, a, a hose, like doing the rain on the windows. Yeah. 
all right, and the hose and the, the fans, we're doing all, and smoke past it. We're doing all that sort of stuff, but we're also working with the visual effects team because once we're done that, the visual effects team puts in the reflections on those chrome mirrors, the yeah. side view mirrors with the chrome. Did You can see the outside world going by in the reflection of those mirrors. <laughs> That's visual effects. We can't do that. We're on a studio. You see reflections of us in those mirrors. <laughs> Uh, and they make that that better. And then sometimes visual effects will need a reference element. I've done that a bunch, reference elements where right. special effects will give them flame reflection, flame lighting, they'll do a flame bar, they'll shoot the flame bar. We create all these elements for visual effects. So we work together closely. So let's go to X-Men, Last Stand. Yep. Big fire scene, there's a big battle with all the mutants and everything else, and you have... I'm assuming pipes and other canisters. You have stuff rigged all over the place. Yes. We how do. much of that is special effects post and how much of that of film at that time was in action where you're really doing special effects? For X-Men, most yeah. of that was practical. We built Alcatraz full scale. We built the bridge. We had explosives and charges all over the bridge. We had areas rigged to collapse and fall down as vehicles hit them. In that Right beside that, we actually had the the danger room set, which is yes. where the ruins were, and they they went into the danger room. And we had ex all of those explosions were real, and we practiced, uh, and we demonstrated to the directors. And we said, for example, see here's this example of a mortar shot into a lake, right? And so we boom. There goes a big gout of water and stuff like that. And they all said, oh, great. And they all walked away. And I'm going, guys, hey, guys, water's all draining out of the lake. That explosion blew a hole right through the bottom of the lake. <laughs> so I said, OK, so we pick a different way to do that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we do our experimenting, not when the camera's running. Right. Right. Because we still experiment a lot. We'll spend weeks experimenting. Well, and the reason I picked out this movie, because now you also get into stunt work, because you have the pipes, you have the other things, they come flying in on the wires, they're they're kicking, they're fighting, but yep. you also have to walk them through as well. I'm assuming this is the hot zone. You can get only so far here, but it looks good in camera, but there's only so, you guys really play with a lot of different pieces, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we have to be careful. So again, you, you've been in film, television, special effects, you, you create sets, you work on all that. But if that's not enough, Chris also works in the real world. With the other side of this, you're involved with the fan base, with conventions, with gaming, which is a huge thing. Tell us a little bit about that other world, because now you're out there engaging with people that have actually paid money, gone to your events, maybe dress up like the characters, but you're out there in this convention world. Well, that's, I've always loved the, the idea that you could create a movie environment in the real world. And I've always wanted to do that. And you know, we generally, I mean, that's problematic. It's expensive. It's dangerous. But if we can get close to it, at least we can get the people involved when you can actually get the actors, the writers, the authors, and actually start to give people a bit of a taste of it. That's just amazing. I was introduced to that 20, almost 30 years ago when I was involved with a, a gaming group called the Saharian. We were a, we were a Star Trek, or, uh, yeah, Star Trek group. And uh, I made, absolutely, and I was a, the commanding, or I was the, I don't know, I can't remember what my rank was, but we helped out to run a VCon, a Vancouver Science Fiction Convention event and I started in hospitality, and that was the last time I saw daylight. <laughs> I got sucked into VCon, and I was involved in, in building parts of VCon out and hosting VCon and running the VCon organization for the next 25 years, and I'm still doing it now. And I'm looking forward now that, that COVID is, is uh, behind us and we can start to run live events again. Very, very, very much looking forward to running live events and creating some more of the hybrid events of film and convention. Because uh, we can do both. It's about imagination. Let's let well, the imagination go. 
Yeah, and you and I've talked about our love for Disney and the imagination and the way it pours out. There's so much of that. But what's it like to say, I worked on that film, I worked as special effects, I built that set, and you hear people walking around, talking about the project you were in the middle of. You were the guy that was unseen on camera, but you brought the light to action they're talking about. What's it like to be in the room with those people? It's it's kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, and I don't think anything about it. And then I end up going to, I'm on stage giving a panel about it. And the panel is set for an hour or an hour and a half. or something. And at the end of the time, I haven't run out of stories. They haven't run out of a desire to listen. And they're all still sitting there listening to me talk. And the other panels are going, Right. Yeah. Right. And it just because it's fun. I I love to share it with other people. Between your two worlds, and I know the VCon stuff is coming back. I know there's great announcements. But we're gonna have you back again and talk about some of those fun things coming around the bend. Where where do you find the most satisfaction? Where do you really enjoy is, is it onset, the creative, the the gags and the props and stuff, or is it being with the convention people, letting them enjoy it and talk about it. These days, I find the most joy, bringing the most joy to people by facilitating the movies and the conventions and other live events. The more of that that I can spread myself around and create the magic for more people and more people and more people, that's where I, I get the most joy. It multiplies out so fast and it's so wonderful. One final question as we kind of wind down here, but if you have a film that you ever could have been involved in, whether, whether past or maybe you know about a film coming up, what would be the number one film you wish you could have been involved in as a special effects technician? My first pat answer is I, we haven't made it yet um, because I love the films. Um, and I think the second answer would be any of them that are fun you can tell that you can tell the audience is having fun you can tell the crew is having fun you can tell the actors are having fun right when you see the behind the scenes and they're laughing or they're being goofy um and there's a lot of film when we can capture that joy and camaraderie in making a film that's the one that's fun well chris again amazing career you've got more stuff coming out the the, oh, the cons always. are coming back so how can they find you what, what's the best social media website what's the best way to find chris sturgis well i got it i was asked that enough that i've got sturgis.ca uh registered and i believe there's a chris sturgis.com as well which points at all of my different my linkedin profile my imdb profile look me up on imdb and uh, you'll find all of the movies that i've i've worked well actually about half a lot of them are not listed because they don't have room. Right. Well, again, that's what I was looking at myself because I know some of the ones we talked about today, some of the ones we talked about in preparation for this, they're not on there, dude. No, no. I tried to get them to add it and I have to go in and I'm actually going to have to get an agent just to talk to them because they won't talk to people not like without their agents. It's, but it's just bureaucracy. Chris Sturgis, thank you for being with us here tonight on Rock to Stage. We really appreciate it. And again, we will have you back because I know you got more stuff coming up. Oh. And as the VCon comes back to live, of course, that's a whole different conversation. Oh, yes, absolutely. And just wait till you start talking or we start talking about the movies we're making. Movies are back, folks. Chris Sturgis, thanks for being here tonight on Rock to Stage show. Again, how to rock the stage every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We bring on amazing guests, celebrities, actors, movie directors, authors, speakers, and global influencers all right here Wednesday night. Make sure you want to come back here and join us. And of course, they're always premiering. So make sure you hit the bell and make sure you want to be a part of the premiere events. Join the live chat, get into the conversation with us and make it a part of your weekly time together. This is all made possible by our wonderful sponsor, Adavita Studios. Adavita has an experienced team that has state-of-the-art technology. It will bring your message to life, your podcast, your audio book, your material will amplify bigger and better with autovita.com. Make sure you contact them and help your projects shine brighter. Hey, that's going to be over tonight in our edition of Rock to Stage Show. We'll be back again 7 o'clock Eastern time next week for another edition and another great unscripted, unplanned conversation with amazing people. 
We'll see you then. For now, I'm the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Have a great night, great week, and keep on shining.